I am a board member of a smallish nonprofit. Our annual budget is around $1 million. Other board members and I are concerned about other staff attending board meetings with the executive director. It sometimes feels like a dog and pony show rather than a candid dialogue. And honestly, our board dialogue is hindered with staff there. Is it best practice to have other staff at board meetings? And is there anything else we can do about this? I think this is going to be another one of those uh, messy answers in that I think there's a lot of variables. So I don't, it, it, my bottom line answer is there, there's no best practice with this. I think it's got, it depends on the organization. It depends on how large the organization is. If you're, if you think about it, if you're a CEO or an executive director of a really large nonprofit, most likely you don't, and you shouldn't know all the nuts and bolts of what's going on in different areas. Right. So you have your directors, right? Your director of finance, your director of ops, your director of marketing, your director of development. And those individuals probably have a voice and things to share occasionally with the board and you want to bring them in to your board meeting for whether it's the whole meeting or maybe it's just to share their report or update or whatever is sort of the topic at hand for the board. So I think in that case, it probably makes sense. And yet for an organization this size, I think if there's some discomfort and the person writing this is a board member and is uncomfortable with it, that that conversation needs to be had with the executive director of what how they're feeling stifled. And the executive director is going to have to make a decision about how or if they engage staff. Right. So I think what kind of what I'm getting out of the question, too, is that it says it sometimes feels like a dog and pony show because there's other staff there. So is there a staff member, particular, like a non-executive director staff member that's monopolizing the conversation? It, it feels that way. Because in that case, I mean, in that case, yeah, absolutely have a conversation with that executive director and say, whoever this other person is, you know, you know, maybe it's the CFO, right? <laughs> maybe <laughs> you CFOs are problematic. <laughs> the worst. They're the worst. Like get this, you know, figure out, you know, give this guy a reporting schedule and say, this is what you need to report on. But but it shouldn't be a dog and pony show. The other thing that I would say is because you're on the board, one of the things that you can recommend is is going more to a committee structure. Because it sounds like if it's a, if it's if it feels like you're not really getting into those deep detailed issues, it's probably because you're spending a lot of time handling normal stuff. Like here's our fundraising report, here's our finance report, here's our right, here's our programming yes. report. So you're, you're like going through that motion, and you don't feel like you can ever get into the meat of anything because you're too busy just like following the actual agenda that's already been set. So, so if you come up with a committee structure where you've got a group of people that are on the finance committee and they can dig into the financials separately and have a conversation that gets way in the weeds on those kinds exactly. of things and then bring those reports back to the full board, then you can spend more of that board time on, on big substantive issues that you want to talk about and not like saying like, can I get a motion to approve the balance sheet? Yes. Sure. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. And I mean, at the end of the day, let's be honest, it's a board meeting. So the board can say, we don't want, this is a board meeting. We don't want staff there. I mean, it, that doesn't really bode well. Now, how do you I, feel about that? I don't like that because I think it really, I would hope you have an executive director you trust enough that they would know if and when they should bring staff in. Yeah. So what I, do you think? I, I, I've, I've been in organizations that do it all different ways. I, I think early on in my career, I was at an organization. I was not anywhere near the top levels of this organization. And the, the executive director made it a point that in the board meeting, he would invite a handful of staff members just to sit in the back. They, they didn't have a report or anything. They just, I wanted, he wanted those people to sit in the room so that they could hear the kinds of things that the board was talking about because they thought that was important for line level staff to get. Um, I thought that was, I mean, as, That's as, interesting. as like somebody who was brand new in the field, it was a very long time ago, obviously, like I thought that was awesome because now right. I'm in a room with all these really, right. really like important people in there. And but also at the same time, it kind of made me realize like what a, what a clown show some <laughs> board meetings can be, right? <laughs> many, <laughs> like, many board like meetings. they're talking about stuff and you're like, That's not what's happening. Right? right. So you get, you get a different vent, a different sort of lens on it too. But then there are other places where. Yeah, if the staff is disruptive or you just pull in a whole bunch of people as a, you know, human shield for the executive director, like, let's bring the finance person in and he can take all the hits exactly. about everything, right? So then maybe it's not such a good idea either. But as a board member, it's it's your call, really. You get to you, you get to tell the executive director, you know what we'd like to see? And then... Exactly. And then, yeah. Exactly. And I also think that we've also, I mean, 
Andy, I'm sure you've seen this with, with an organization this size, oftentimes they don't have that many, the executive director could be wearing a lot of the hats of yeah. sort of the direct, you know, sort of the finance director, the HR director hat, all of those things at this size organization. Yes. So then they may have more like line level staff that they go, God, these staff would be bored out of their mind. They want to be practicing and out there in the field doing their work. And there's, I don't see any room for these people to grow, which would be sad, but, but then, you know, I think that's the executive director's call. And yet at the end of the day, I mean, so what I would hope is there's just, again, I go back to conversation because I think that's what's missing. Like if the board is feeling uncomfortable with this or like it's a dog and pony show, they need to have that conversation with the executive director and say, so let's problem solve this together. And, or what does this look like? Yeah. And, and have conversations with your other board members too. Cause if, yes. if it's most likely, if you feel this way, there's at least one other person that feels the same way that you do. Exactly. So maybe pull, pull the other board members and see who feels the same way. And then you can kind of have more of a show of force to have things change rather than it just be you complaining about it might help. And I also think this is where a relationship between the board chair and the executive director can be so important because it can feel as an executive director, like you're being um, attacked. (laughs) Uh, If the board comes at you telling you that they really, your staff suck or you don't, they don't like how they're delivering. It can feel, and and I've seen executive directors get super protective when anybody says that. So that's a great way for the board to kind of convene themselves in perhaps an executive session with no staff to talk about this issue, see if they have consensus, and then the board chair to go have a nice conversation during one of their regular meetups with the executive director about it. Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything, the podcast about everything nonprofit, with your host, Andy Shurick and Stacy Wedding. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Nonprofit Everything. Um, Stacy and I are excited that you're here. We've got a good episode for you this week. Um, if you would, please... Go ahead and and send us a question. We we love getting new questions. Um, we if if the best thing is even if you don't have a question yourself, go ahead and just like think of one that you've heard or some weird thing that had happened that you just want to tell us about, and we can we can talk about that. Um, a lot of our questions we get from from things people tell us. Uh, so if you don't send us an official question, we'll just start making them up. True confession. Yeah, and you can. So here's the thing: you can. We're on. We're on Facebook. Finally, it only took a year, or so we're on Woo-hoo! Facebook. You can go to Small Facebook. Small victories. All right. You can. You can. Um, you can ask us a question there. If you want to make it anonymous, hit the messaging button, and you can send us a messaging one there too. So, Twitter, Facebook, the nonprofit everything webpage, the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits sponsor or the 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 host, the presenter of this podcast. You can ask questions on the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits page as well. But Please, we want to hear from you. Today's episode is sponsored by Brenda J. Stout CPA, a full-service accounting firm specializing in nonprofit tax compliance and IRS problem resolution. Find out more at brendastoutcpa.com or check the Nonprofit Everything show notes for contact information. Thank you, Brenda J. Stout CPA. Thank you, Brenda. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, we have a fantastic guest expert to bring on for our next question. Uh, I'd like to introduce Katie Hoffman. She's a director out of the Reno office of Fenimore Craig. She works in the Government Relations and Regulatory Practice Group, and Katie's a go-to regulatory attorney for clients in the areas of gaming and sweepstakes and promotional contests, and is especially knowledgeable with the intricacies of the laws and regulations of online promotions, such as necessary legal structures, bonding and registration requirements, and official rules language which of course makes her the perfect guest for this next question. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So, so here's the question. The Nevada legislature just passed AB 117, which changed some of the rules about charitable raffles and gaming. So as a nonprofit that occasionally does those kinds of things, what do I need to know? Sure. Well, the first thing nonprofits need to do is be able to recognize when they're having a raffle or lottery that requires registration with the Nevada Gaming Control Board. And so anytime a nonprofit is having um, a fundraiser that involves selling opportunities to win a prize, um, such as a raffle or a giveaway, um, that's when they need to start thinking about their obligations under Nevada law. So the, uh, the, the examples that we used to hear of is like if you wanted to do a bingo night, you would, the, the old way is that you would contact the Gaming Control Board and I think you sent them like $25 and that was sort of the end of it. 
Yes. So same idea. Um, bingo would be included under these registration requirements, poker nights, um, raffles, um, those type of events are all covered by, by this new legislation that uh, tunes up some of the registration requirements for nonprofits. Great. So, so what are the new requirements? So when charities are thinking about doing these fundraisers, they need to submit an application to the Nevada Gaming Control Board. Um, those applications are uh, have a variety of requirements, but some of the new notable ones charities should keep on their radar um, are that they're going to have to provide operational controls um, for these raffles or, or charitable games. And so those will include, they have to have things like um, having audit controls for their ticket sales. They need to be able to uh, provide the official rules that they're going to be giving out for the game. Um, they're going to have to explain the methods of awarding prizes and how they'll announce winners. Um, so they need to have a detailed plan for how they're going to conduct these games and make sure that they're conducted fairly. Okay, and then are those, are those filed with the state? Do they need to be made public as well? or? Yeah, so those will all be filed with the Nevada Gaming Control Board. Um, the control board will have a fee that's associated um, with filing those applications. They're, they're working on rules right now that will specify um, the amount of fee. But I think what's really important for charities to keep in mind is having a good set of rules in place for their raffles or charitable games. Because these rules are not only required now under this new legislation, but they actually are important for charities um, to protect themselves and to make sure that they're uh, operating their game in a way that's, that's fair for players, fair for them, and uh, protects their interests in the event that there's a dispute about the result. That makes sense. I imagine there's their best practices or templates or what, how would a charity who wants to do a raffle go about drafting those? What's the, what's the best way to do that? You know, there's a lot of resources online that nonprofits can start with. Um, for really high value ones, it might make sense to work with an attorney to make sure you're protected. Um, the rules should cover things like who's responsible for paying the taxes. Does the nonprofit have the right of publicity to show the winner's um, picture or release their name? How will disputes be resolved? Um, the rules should also really carefully describe the prize that's being awarded and make sure to explain what is um, or isn't included with that prize. Um, another important facet for rules is making sure that the charity is not liable in the event that the winner is injured uh, while using the prize. For example, if they win a car and they crash a car, you want to make sure your rules uh, make the charity not responsible for that. <laughs> that's, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. But it, but it makes sense. Um, and and I, I assume that they're really onerous penalties that they've put in place if a charity doesn't do it the right way. Well, in the state of Nevada, operating um, a raffle is essentially operating, um, is conducting gambling, basically. So you don't want to be conducting gambling in the state of Nevada um, unless you have the appropriate registration with the control board. Great. So is there a, is, are there any thresholds or anything that people need to remember? So if it's, I mean, I think the first question we would get would be something like, you know, we're just, we're just doing a bingo and it's just a handful of people. So do, do we really need to mess with this? Um, the answer is yes. You do need to think about those obligations. Anytime you um, are conducting one of these events, there is no um, sort of bottom threshold. If charities are concerned that the registration requirements or the operational obligations are, are maybe a little bit out of their reach. Um, other fundraising methods could be, you know, conducting a silent auction or a bake sale. Um, but if you want to do this sort of gambling based um, fundraising, you need, you need to make sure you're complying with the requirements. And I, I assume there's, that's kind of a technical term then. So the, does the statute then tell you specifically what it means when it says gambling? Sure. So there are a couple different um, types of, of gambling related fundraisers that, that fall under the control board's purview. Um, the first is a, a raffle or a lottery. Um, that's basically just selling tickets for the chance to win a prize. Um, bingo is the other one. Uh, poker nights are another. Um, those are the types of events we're talking about here. Great. Are the, does the state provide any resources to kind of help the to help nonprofits walk through the process or is maybe that's something they're planning? 
Yeah, so I would encourage listeners who have questions about this to visit the Gaming Control Board's website, and that's gaming.nv.gov. And the control board is actually in the process right now of developing some more specific regulations um, that'll help charities um, understand their obligations and what they need to do to conduct compliant fundraisers. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that link in the show notes so that you don't have to scroll back and write that down really quick. So you can just go to the Nonprofit Everything website and you'll be able to click that link there. So the other feature that was added in this new legislation is the ability for nonprofits to conduct online ticket sales for their raffles or charitable lottery fundraisers, which obviously is is a great way for charitable organizations to reach a broader audience and advertise their events um, and really increase the scale of these fundraising opportunities. Now, the trick for those online sales is that the charity has to be able to demonstrate that anyone who is purchasing a raffle ticket was inside the state of Nevada at the time of purchase. So that implies that there are going to be some technological standards and requirements for charities um, in order to be able to demonstrate that. Um, The control board is working right now to develop those technical standards. So that's something charities who want to do online ticket sales are going to need to look at. That sounds a lot like when when they decided online sports betting was going to be okay in Nevada and you needed to be physically in Nevada to do it. So I assume it's going to be something similar then. Exactly. Um, You probably are looking at a similar um, type of technological standard. Um, It's probably going to be something more than just verifying that the ticket purchaser is a Nevada resident or um, has a Nevada address. It's going to be demonstrating that they were physically inside the state at the time of purchase. And is that something that, that the state would help certify vendors that can do that? It seems like, I mean, as a, as a nonprofit thinking about doing that kind of thing, I, I could imagine you would, I wouldn't honestly know the questions to ask the vendor to be able to make that determination. So that is exactly what the control board is working on right now, is developing those standards and the process that charities will need to use in order to have um, the right vendors and technology in place to meet that requirement. So we should know more in a few months, um, hopefully by the beginning of October. So earlier you mentioned uh, who was responsible for taxes. Is, the, is there, can you go into a little bit more detail on the tax situation for the nonprofits? Sure. Taxes are something nonprofits should always keep in the back of their mind um, when conducting raffles or other uh, giveaways. Anytime a nonprofit um, awards a winner $600 or more in prize money, and that can be cash or merchandise prizes, the nonprofit actually has an obligation to report that winning to the IRS. And if the prize exceeds $5,000, then there could be an obligation um, on the nonprofit to withhold some of that money. So when you hit those thresholds, $600 and $5,000, nonprofits should really coordinate with their tax professionals to make sure they're meeting those obligations correctly. Katie, thank you so much for sharing that information. That's fantastic. And um, your contact information will be on the show notes as well. So if people want to reach out to you for more information, they'll be able to get to you there. And uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Okay, Stacey, here's one for you. One of our board members is interested in loaning our campaign one of his employees. We're concerned about a number of things, including that his employee is also a member of our board and that the two of them think she shouldn't have to report to anyone on our staff. Any thoughts or advice you can share? Well, I think that could get dicey quickly if there weren't some clear expectations set from the very beginning. I I honestly think with something like this, you want to have a discussion and perhaps even Maybe it's setting up an MOU in writing with sort of a a job description overview of here's what this looks like. Here's what the structure is, Um, because in this role, right, as a loaned executive or a loaned expert in something, while that person is volunteering their service, um, they also have to be held accountable as a volunteer for for to somebody for what they're doing. right? Right. So I don't it's not to me. There's got to be some sort of accountability structure, and I feel like that needs to be formalized. I think things like this do better, you know, with a conversation first about 
between both parties, but then perhaps just making sure everyone's clear and having something documented in writing, which could help in the future too. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Yeah, you can sort of tell by the way the question's written too, is like concerned about a number of things. I'm, I'm kind of concerned about a number of things too, that the, I don't know. We, I think we had this conversation a few weeks ago too, about, about board members that felt like when they were volunteering that they, the rules didn't apply right. to them. That they were still in their board member, like a, like an authority role. Yeah. And that's, that's when you're volunteering as a, as in a program capacity or in any other capacity, you really need to be sort of subservient to whatever yes. the, the staff is asking yes. you to do. So, so in this case, what do you think? How do you, how do you approach this board? I mean, how do you, how do you talk to this board member and say, hey, we really appreciate your what you're trying to do, but, but we need to sort of set some clear boundaries about what you can and can't do as a volunteer? Yeah, I mean, I think it's maybe it's an education opportunity. So, again, I, I, I look at things like this and think perhaps it's just someone not understanding the difference and the nuance between those two roles. And so it's sort of it's it's a conversation with the board member who's going to be in that role, as well as, you know, the board member, um, you know, sharing, okay, so there's kind of two, there's two hats for you as a board member. You're, you're in a fiduciary governing role in this capacity. And as a volunteer, you become really, um, just like we have, you know, someone on staff who manages volunteers, we have that person who's going to play that role. And so it's a different hat you're wearing. And I think it's that, approach. I don't know if I'm making this super too simplistic, but I honestly think it's that. I think it's kind of an educational thing. And so here's what we're thinking would make sense. Um, and are you comfortable with it? And and if they're not comfortable with it, then guess what? It's probably better to figure that out at the beginning rather than halfway through. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point because I think a lot of staff members, I mean, depending on what your organization's like, a lot of staff members don't have an awful lot of impact or a, um, they don't get to talk to the board members very often. No. And depending on the organization, those board members could be like really important people. They right? could. And, and so staff members have this tendency to be um, really deferential yes. and like, you know, this is a board member. We need to do whatever they say. And and the executive director may have a different relationship with the board members than a staff member would. And so you're really setting yourself up for some weird things to have happen if that's, you know, that that differential and in, in yes. importance is too much. And I actually think that it's also perhaps an opportunity to bring the staff member who's going to be the point of contact for this board member or the one in essence sort of supervising the work in the loaned executive capacity. It, it there's there's potential for that staff member to um, be a part of that dialogue and educated too, because to your point, if the staff member is looking at this as as someone who they need to defer to, and whatever this person says goes, yeah. uh, that's going to be dangerous too. So it's kind of like the education or the kind of setting the expectations needs to happen on both fronts at the beginning, and that staff member needs to be empowered, um, and obviously, hopefully, knows that if they are going to have any kind of tough conversation with that quote loaned executive board <laughs> member, they probably need to go to the executive director first and troubleshoot that. I mean, but I think being a super clear on the scope is important, super clear on the deliverables and what's the timeline and what's yeah. our check-in and communication process. And it, and, and this is just, and sort of telling the board member, it's not something unique to them. This is just the process the organization uses when working with any volunteer. And this would be in the same light with the board members. So it doesn't feel like something that is being um, custom tailored or like that board members being kind of ostracized because they're a board member. Yeah. Or coddled. Or co- yeah. Coddled. Yeah. <laughs> that makes, that makes a lot of sense. But I mean, all the volunteer managers I know are the people that run volunteer groups. I mean, they're all fantastic anyway, and they give they everybody are. the best respect. And they do. so, so it's, it's like, you should trust your volunteer folks to be able to manage pretty much anybody who's in that, you know, in that capacity. Absolutely. I think though, this kind of leads to a larger, a larger topic. It, it, there's so much, uh, work and discussion that happens about board roles and responsibilities. And yet I don't think many staff even understand the board's roles and responsibilities in an organization. So oftentimes there is that lack of clarity. And so staff will even be confused themselves about what that interaction looks like. So this really seems like a great opportunity if you're going to move forward with it, the person who wrote this, like to educate everybody like and sort of hey this is what we do and this is a cool opportunity and thank you to this you know person lending their time to us Uh, but it's definitely in a volunteer role not in a board role yeah (music) 
We are so excited. We are a seven-year-old nonprofit and just received a request by a potential funder to see our facilities. We recently applied for a grant from them, and as part of their due diligence process, they'd like to see our programs in action. Do you have any suggestions on how we can make this an amazing experience? Oh, I have so many suggestions, Good. and I'm <laughs> such a nerd about this. So first of all, congratulations. That's so cool when you get that opportunity and you're not begging someone to come see your own facilities, right, or your own you know, programs in action. So you know, kudos to you. That's awesome. Um, so this, some of my ideas around this are nothing that are mind blowing, but they are so basic that I see organizations again and again, fail to do these, these little things. So like, if you think about the kind of Nordstrom's gold standard of customer service, and you think about what that means in every stage of being a Nordstrom's customer, right? You are treated with with just, you know, the utmost um, respect and uh, just kind of integrity and welcoming, like just you're welcomed. I think you want that same feel for this experience. So I think it's everything from, okay, great, let's get the date on the calendar. And then the day before you're sending them this nice little love note about, we can't wait to see you tomorrow. And making sure you schedule them during a time where you actually have something going on in your program or your office, because if that's possible, that's going to make for such a better experience. Mm -hmm. And before I keep rambling, I I mean, do you, have you ever seen that before Andy, where like someone comes in and nothing's going on and then it's kind of like, okay, yeah, well, this is where this happens when it is happening. Yeah. You're like showing off just a building (laughs) instead of a program, right? Right. (laughs) This is where I, this is where I sit and this is my computer, right? And I know that's the real, sometimes it happens like that and that's okay, right? You have to try to then bring to life what's going on there. But if mm-hmm. there's any way to schedule this when there's a program, whether it's on site or off site or something so the donor can actually see it, that'd be cool. But anyway, I mean, I think it's everything from kind of the confirmation the day before to the welcoming when they come in the door. And let's talk about that for a second. So I recently was on, I'm going to share a real life example. I was actually recently on a site visit um, for for an or for a funder. And, uh, I went in and here's the difference. I went into one organization where that front person who greeted me totally knew, you know, was either they were just a class act or someone prepped them and they were just like, great. We're so excited to have you here. Can I get you water? Let me go get so-and-so right to meet with you. I mean, it was just that you felt good walking in that door, good energy versus another one where I walked in and it was like, it took you know, it it wasn't a big deal, but took a while to get anyone's attention. And then the person seemed like they could have cared less and then waited 15 minutes in the lobby and sort of twiddled my thumbs. And it was not like, it's not about a power being on a power trip, but it's just how you kind of want to just serve people in general. Sort of, right. Yeah. That just doesn't seem right. makes sense because it's a proxy for how you treat your clients too, Yeah, and so that's what to me was kind of eye-opening. So anyways, so so I think thinking about that, you know, prepping that first person who's going to greet the person Uh, and then, you know, also if I, I love it when I go on a site visit to an organization and I get to meet other staff who share, if it's a large enough organization, if not, then it's fine having the executive director or a board member volunteer or whatever. But like, I love it if there's other staff that can share or talk about their experiences in the trenches, because then it kind of feels a little, um, it brings it to life more and makes it feel more real instead of. This whole, like, what can feel a little bit like a, a show of show, you know, in someone who's sort of removed or detached from some of the work. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think so. In some of the organizations I've worked, they've been like very specific tours. Yes. So, and people come on tours all the time, and there's actually a script, and you know exactly what to say in what area of the building, you know, what programs you're supposed exactly. to highlight, what the challenges that you're you're trying to circumvent or overcome those kinds of things per area. And it, it it's generally written down and you don't necessarily memorize it, but you have to know everything that's in there and you hand it off from employee to employee. So if this person is in charge of this particular program, you let them talk about it because then they'll be able to answer intelligently if you get a specific question and to think about it from that level so that it's something that you, you should be doing it not just only when you've got um, funders coming through on on a, on a site visit, but you should be doing it for your volunteers. You should be doing it for any donors. I mean, it's one of the greatest things is when you, you call a donor who's given you a tiny bit of money and you say, Hey, 
have you been down to the, have you seen what we do? And yes. a lot of times they'll say, no, I haven't. And you can invite them and say, well, why don't you come on down and we'll give you a tour. And they feel like they give you 20 bucks. And they're like, wow, yes. we're getting like the red carpet treatment. That's amazing. Right. And then you've just made a donor for life. Oh, you have. It's a golden opportunity. So, and then I think, you know, after it, if the, because this is more of a formal scheduled, you know, site visit or tour, I think after you've done kind of, you know, you're done giving the tour, then, you know, if there's a, a sit down, if there's a space to sit down where then you can give them a nice folder with some, you know, some of your basic info, right? You know, if you've got marketing collateral or just a basic fact sheet or whatever it is, it doesn't have to be fancy. I right. think people stress about that. And really, as long as it's professional and put together, but like giving them a takeaway, right? Something they can take away, but then also being there to talk about, that's your opportunity. And it's also a great opportunity to not just be talking at the donor, but to really, that's where I think organizations struggle all the time, right? They just want to, it's like diarrhea of the mouth and let me just tell you <laughs> everything and anything and amazing and how great we are. And, and guess what? That's lovely. And I, as a donor, want to be able to hopefully be asked questions. I can share with you why I even care enough to be there. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a conversation. It should be. Yeah. Should be if it's done well. So I, I think all of that. And then, of course, I mean, this is and if you have a video at that time, like it or a video you could show. Oh, like I hate that's, videos. Oh, you do? I hate videos. Why? I don't know. They just seem so. I don't know. I always they feel inauthentic to me. That's just my opinion. <laughs> it's like every time I see a some, sorry for like, anyone who's made a great video. video yeah. yeah. Every time I see a pre-produced video, I just think uh, I think it brings. <laughs> so here's where I think a video makes I totally get what you're saying. And I also think that there's an opportunity if you aren't seeing some programs in action to sort of, if it's in the, if it's not a video where it's just a bunch of talking heads, but you actually get to see the clients doing something or get to watch it, then at least it kind of gives me as a donor or a potential donor, a visual of what I'm missing in your office. So, oh, yeah, so I sense. don't know. That's uh, I mean, okay. I'm, I'm on your team. now. Are you on my yeah, team, on now? team now? Okay. So you were ready to, okay. you know, arm wrestle me on that one. <laughs> And then I think, you know, last but not least, of course, is the thank you. Um, I'm dumbfounded because the the particular example I have in mind. So it was uh, some local site visits and some site visits in another uh, out of state. And all in all, there were about 10 site visits and not one organization sent an email or a written card. Thank you. Follow up. And oh. I was a bit shocked because that feels very uh, basic to me. Yeah. Like just that it would have been like, thanks so much for stopping by and letting us share our program with you or whatever. And it's, again, it's not that I'm looking for my butt to be kissed. It's more like just, again, a service, like how, how do you treat people? And you're trying to get money from me and have never gotten it before. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not even getting sort of a thank you for taking an hour out of my time. And I realize I probably should thank you too for doing that, but, but it's just kind of a weird dynamic. So well, see, I, you, yeah. you're losing an opportunity to ask if there are any other questions that you yes. can answer, right? Or like, thank you for coming on the tour. You know, I know we covered a lot of stuff. Was there, if there's anything else I can help you with, or please, here's my phone number. Here's my email address. Right. Yeah. So even if it's not like officially a thank you, right. it's still an opportunity to reach back out to a donor. Why are you missing it? Is. it? Yeah. So anyway, there's, there's Stacey's list. I probably overwhelmed everybody listening. <laughs> I hope you took notes. <laughs> yes. If I ever come on a site visit for some reason, you'll know what to there do. There will be a test. reached the finish line. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nonprofit Everything, where Andy and I just barrage you with questions and answers and try to make sense of things, or if not, bring in experts. And we so appreciate you being here. And this wouldn't be possible without your questions. So your engagement means the world to us. And the cool thing is, newsflash, if you don't know about this, we do have our own Nonprofit Everything Facebook page now. So uh, you can make uh, you know, if you don't want to go to nonprofiteverything.com, check us out on Facebook and like the page and uh, send us a question there. Mm -hmm.